Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to go. We're going to go over experiment 18, which is about finding the Ka of a weak acid, specifically acetic acid, which is found in vinegar, by multiple methods. But, um, as we go through this video, we are going to answer questions that will help you write your hypothesis. So I strongly recommend you think about what you want to put in your hypothesis as you watch this video, uh, because we will go over uh, many of those things. So the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is weak acid chemistry. So if we have a weak acid, HA, aqueous, interacting with water, liquid, you're going to end up with an equilibrium reaction. And weak acid chemistry, and weak base chemistry for that matter, is the same as other equilibrium chemistry. It's just for weak acids and weak bases. So what's going to happen is you're going to have HA, the weak acid, interact with water, a, in this case, weak base. You'll recall that acids are proton donors. So HA will donate a proton to water. Water will act as a base, which in this case is a proton acceptor. So what we're going to have is an equilibrium reaction where the equilibrium, in this case, strongly favors HA because it's a weak acid. And what we end up with is H3O plus aqueous plus A minus aqueous. And in this case, HA donated its protons to water, its proton to water, so it acted as an acid. Water acted as a base. After H2O gains a proton, it becomes H3O+. H3O plus has no interest in gaining another proton. In fact, it wants to go in the reverse direction and lose that proton to reform water. So therefore, it is the conjugate acid of the weak base water. A minus is now HA without a proton. So remember that you lose H plus. So HA becomes A minus. You lose the H and the plus charge. This now wants to pick up a proton. Specifically, it wants to pick up a proton from H3O plus. So this is going to act as a base. And this is your conjugate base. And this works for weak acids, generic weak acid HA. In this specific case, though, we're going to use acetic acid. And acetic acid happens to be CH3COOH. And if you take organic chemistry, you'll learn that this is a carboxylic acid group. And it can also interact with water in the exact same way as HA. In fact, it is an HA, if you will. And this is the acidic proton, which it will donate to water. And what we end up with is H3O plus aqueous plus CH3COO minus, commonly called acetate, aqueous. So acetic acid acts as the weak acid, and it forms H3O plus and acetate. Water acts as a base. H3O plus is the conjugate acid, and acetate is the conjugate base, just like above. But we can write an equilibrium Ka expression for this. Now, the difference between Ka and Kc that you may have learned, or Keq, depends on which book you're using, what they call it, any other equilibrium constant, is nothing. It's still products over reactants. Well, in this case, the products that are aqueous are the concentration of H3O+, plus, concentration of CH3COO-, minus, over the concentration of CH3COO-. H, the acetic acid. This is the Ka expression. Just like in other equilibrium expressions, we don't put solids and liquids. So water is a liquid, we do not put it in the Ka expression. So our goal is to find the Ka and also the pKa. And you probably um, have learned that the P of any of these functions is simply just the negative log of, in this case, the Ka. So the pH is the negative log of the H3O plus concentration. The pKa is the negative log of the Ka, so on and so forth. So this is basically our goal. Well, it turns out that it's relatively easy to measure the H3O plus concentration and then extrapolate the acetate concentration. We can measure the concentration of H3O plus experimentally by measuring the pH of the solution, which Tim will show you how to do in a little while. We will then know by stoichiometry for every one H3O plus, we get one acetate. So we can also know the acetate concentration. 
So these things are relatively easy to find experimentally by simply inserting a pH meter, as we'll show you in a little while. But what we also need in order to find the Ka, and then subsequently the pKa, is the concentration of acetic acid. And it turns out it's a little bit challenging to find the concentration of acetic acid. Now you've done this before, but what you're going to have to do is six titrations, all right, in order to find the concentration of the acetic acid. So this can be relatively time consuming. What we're going to do to find the concentration of the acetic acid is we're going to react it with a strong base. And when we react, when we react it with a strong base, we no longer have an equilibrium reaction. Specifically, we're going to take CH3COOH aqueous, and we're going to react it with NaOH aqueous. And because NaOH is a strong base, this is not going to be an equilibrium reaction. It's going to deprotonate this acetic acid. And what we're going to end up with is CH3COO minus with Na plus, which is aqueous. So this proton is going to go with OH minus and form H2O liquid, the other product. What's left? The Na plus and the CH3COO minus. So this is the reaction we're going to do in order to find the concentration of acetic acid. But to make things a little bit more complicated, we don't know the concentration of NaOH. So before we can react the NaOH with acetic acid, we need to know the NaOH concentration in order to um, do, this, do these calculations. And specifically, what we're going to do is what you've done before, if you took general chemistry one here or maybe somewhere else, is we're going to standardize the NaOH using something called KHP. So the first thing that you're going to want to do to standardize the NaOH is to make the NaOH solution. And to do that, you're going to take um, 5 molar NaOH and you're going to make 150 milliliters of approximately 0.1 molar NaOH. I'm not going to do this calculation with you anymore because I've done it so many times on these videos that we would like you to do this independently. Specifically, to do this, you want to use C1V1 equals C2V2. Make sure you have that calculation done before you come to lab uh, because this lab is a lot of work. We're then going to take that NaOH and we're going to react it with KHP. Now, KHP is this large organic acid right here. This is KHP. And we're going to react it with NaOH. And KHP also has a carboxylic acid fun functional group, just like acetic acid. And this is the acidic proton. So this H goes with OH to form water, OH minus to form water. And then Na comes here. And what we end up with is this deprotonated KHP, if you will, like this where now we have O minus Na plus, this is aqueous, and H2O liquid. Now this looks like a complicated um, reaction, but the truth of the matter is all we care about is the stoichiometric coefficients. So what we're going to do is we're going to put about 0 0.2 grams of KHP into a 150 or even a 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. We're going to add a few milliliters of water, maybe 25 milliliters of water, and we're going to dissolve it. We're going to add a couple drops of phenolphthalein. We're going to add NaOH to our burette, and we're going to perform this titration. When we do this, we're going to use a specific amount. So in my case, the KHP that Tim is going to use in the titration in a minute is 0 0.210, uh, 219, it should be a 9. Let me try again. 0 0.2190 grams of KHP. Around 0.2 grams. The initial burette reading that we got was 5.21 milliliters. The final burette reading that we got was 15.87 milliliters, meaning that the volume of NaOH that we used was 15.87 minus 5.21, or 
milliliters. Now, with this information, we can, we can calculate the precise concentration of the NaOH solution. Before we do that, I just need to move my paper here a little bit so that I can fit it on the screen. So to do this, what we want to do is we want to convert from grams of KHP to moles of KHP to moles of NaOH. And then finally, we want to divide by liters of NaOH, and this will give us the molarity of the NaOH solution. And you're going to do this over three trials. We're only going to demonstrate one trial here, and Tim will show you actually how to physically do that in a few minutes. But we're starting with 0 0.2190 grams of KHP times, well, the molar mass of KHP is 204.22 grams of KHP is one mole of KHP times. We now want to convert from moles of KHP to moles of NaOH. We're going to use the stoichiometric coefficients. One of these reacts with one of these. So for every one mole of KHP, we're going to get one mole of, we're going to use one mole of NaOH times, now we want to divide by the volume in liters. We put a unit list one on the top, that moves the moles over, and then we put the liters on the bottom. It's very important that we can't put the 10.66 milliliters, we need to convert that to liters, divide by a thousand, which is 0 0.01066 liters. And when we do that, we find that this is 0 0.1006 molar NaOH solution. We're going to repeat this for three trials and determine the average molarity as well as the um, precision of our measurements, specifically the standard deviation and relative standard deviation. I'm now going to turn it over to Tim, who's going to show you how to actually um, perform this titration because it may have been a while since you've done a titration. So, as Colin said, I'm now going to walk through doing the actual titration with you. The first thing when you're doing a titration is you need to get your burette actually set up. So to set up a burette, what you need to do is you need to get one from the drawer. You're gonna use water to rinse it three times. In order to rinse it with water three times and then eventually for your NIOH, you're gonna need a small funnel. If you put a small funnel in the top, it'll be much easier to pour water and NaOH solution into the burette than it will be if you're trying to pour it into the very small opening on top of the burette without the funnel. So, uh, I've already rinsed my burette three times with water. I put a little water in the top, I let it come to the bottom, I opened my stopcock, let it drain out, and I did that three times. Then I took a little bit of NaOH, I poured a little bit of NaOH in, let that run out, did that an extra time, and now I've filled it with NaOH uh, solution in order to begin my titration. Uh, the first thing that I need to do is I need to make sure I have everything I need. So the first thing I have is a waste beaker for anything I need to let run out of here. When I was draining it with water and with NaOH, I drained it into this waste beaker. I also have my KHP solution ready to go. If you look, you can see on my beaker that I have it labeled with the grams of KHP in this flask. That's important because I'm going to be doing this three times if I was doing this in the lab. So I would need to be able to differentiate which of my flasks is which because the grams of KHP is in the calculation for determining the concentration of my NaOH. So if I get them mixed up, then my volumes won't uh, be appropriate for the grams I'm using and my concentration will be way off. I've also got my extra NaOH on hand just in case I need it, but I should be good to go. One important thing to note before we begin is, if you notice, my KHP solution is way over here. Uh, I don't have anything underneath my uh, burette right now, so I'm actually going to put my waste beaker there. It's important just to keep your waste beaker underneath your burette while it's sitting here, just in case there's an errant drop that comes out um, of the beaker of NaOH. Uh, or rather of the burette of NaOH, just to be safe so we're not making a mess. I will not put my solution of KHP underneath the burette until I'm ready to begin the titration. 
But for now, I've got my KHP ready to go. I added a couple of drops of phenolphthalein already, and all I need to do is begin my titration. So to begin my titration, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to read the initial volume of my burette. So I've zoomed in on my burette, and it's kind of fuzzy right now, but it'll come into uh, clarity in a second. Uh, and what you're going to need in order to read the initial reading of your burette is a piece of paper. So I'm going to take that piece of paper, I'm going to put it behind the burette, and you'll notice that it jumps into focus when I do that as well, which is convenient for us. And the reason I've got a piece of paper here is because it adds me better contrast to see what I'm doing. So if I look at my burette, I'll see that I want to read from the top down. The reason you want to do that in a burette is because it starts at zero at the top, and then it counts down to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, etc. So I want to read from the five reading downwards. So in this case, I have five milliliters. Then each of these graduations is 0.1 milliliters. So I want to count down from five to 5.1 to 5.2, and it's just a little bit past, so we're going to call it 5.21 milliliters. It's important to use the piece of paper for contrast because uh, you're going to lose focus, but if I pull this away even and it keeps a little bit of focus, you can see that it's a lot harder to see the black lines on here without the paper. So if we leave the paper nice and close, we get a nice sharp uh, background in order to see our initial burette reading. So we're going to read down, like I said, 5.21 milliliters. We're going to eventually, in a minute here, we're going to begin our titration, which is going to drain our volume down, and we'll read the final volume in the exact same way using this piece of paper uh, once we're done with the titration. So now we're ready to do our actual titration. So when you do your titration, the things you're going to need are you're going to need to be messing with this stopcock here, and by opening it, we'll drain NaOH into our flask in order to uh, do the titration. And we'll also need to be swirling our flask constantly to make sure that the NaOH is thoroughly mixing with the um, KHP so that we're not just making a locally concentrated solution, and instead we're waiting for the con uh, pH of the entire solution to change to neutral and basic. So. To do that, the best thing for us to do is we're going to take our waste speaker out of the way and we're going to put our piece of paper, our trusty piece of paper we just used, underneath our uh, burette and then we're going to place our flask underneath it. The reason we do that is because once we start adding the NaOH, we want a good contrast underneath the uh, flask in order to see it turning pink. So your impulse might be to use the uh, setup such that you're messing with the stopcock with your dominant hand and swirling with your non-dominant hand. But if you try that for a second, you'd find pretty quickly that it's surprisingly difficult to swirl things with your non-dominant hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my burette and I'm actually going to spin it around so that I can swirl the flask with my dominant hand and I can uh, manipulate the stopcock over here with my non-dominant hand, my left hand. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to let some... NaOH run into my flask, and if you notice, it's hard to see on the camera, but you can see a slight pink color appear. I like to run a little bit of the NaOH into the flask without really swirling it to start, just to see that pink appear so that I know for sure I've added my phenolphthalein. It gets pretty awkward if you get to the end of the titration and you've forgotten to add your phenolphthalein. Uh, if you do end up adding a lot of NaOH, uh, like any number of 5 plus milliliters, without having seen any pink in your flask, I would stop and add a little bit of fatal failing to your flask, because it's very likely that you forgot, and if you don't have any, then the titration will be impossible to finish. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to perform the titration. I'm going to let my solution run out of my burette at a little bit of a speed while it's there, and I'm going to swirl my flask, then I'm going to close it, make sure that my pink goes away, I'm going to open it, let it swirl a bit, close it, and notice I haven't stopped swirling the flask this entire time, and I'm not going to stop swirling the flask the entire time until the titration is done. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open my stopcock a little bit. It's actually easier than you might think in order to get the titration to add dropwise. Right now I'm adding my uh, NaOH a drop at a time and that will let me eventually get a very accurate and precise reading on my burette. So 
I'm going to close it, swirl a little bit. There's a drop hanging down, so I'm going to make sure that drop gets in. Then I'm going to add another few drops. And I'm just going to repeat this process over and over again until my solution turns and stays pink uh, despite swirling and uh, everything. So I'm just going to keep adding my drops. If you notice on the camera, it might be a little difficult to see, but the solution is staying pink a little bit longer and a little bit longer as I add more drops. So if I notice that my pink color is staying longer, that means I'm getting closer and closer to my equivalence point in the end of my titration. So I'm just going to keep adding my solution, and you'll notice I've started to slow down a lot. There's no pink right now because I'm adding my NaOH very slowly. So you'll see that that last drop turned my solution nice and pink, and it stayed for a little while. So that means I'm very close to my endpoint. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a single drop of NaOH at a time. And I'm going to add one more drop of NaOH. And any drop now is going to finish my titration. So I'm going to just add one drop which takes a little bit of practice to be able to do well, but by the end of this experiment, you should be a professional at performing an NA uh, titration. And you'll see that that last drop turned my solution pink, and swirling it is not stopping it from turning pink. So now what I can do is I can read my uh, final measurement the same way I read my initial measurement by taking my piece of paper, I'm gonna put it behind, and I'm going to read my final measurement um, off of my uh, burette. So I put my piece of paper up here, I look close, and I see that my final volume is about 15.8 15.87 milliliters. So now I want to show you one more thing before I walk away. Now you'll notice that my solution is nice and pink and my titration is done. That last drop turned it pink and it's staying there. Uh, it's really important in class that you try to make it so that one drop does turn your solution from clear to pink um, because of what I'm about to show you. Now, if I were to add, and I'm going to just open this up for a second and add a healthy amount of NaOH, all right, I just added another mm, two milliliters of NaOH, and my solution doesn't really look any different. It might be a little more pink, I guess, but it doesn't essentially look any different than it was when the titration was perfect. So that's why it's really important to make sure you stop at exactly the drop that turns your solution from clear to pink, because you can't tell if you've gone too far. If you've gone too far, it still just looks pink exactly like it did when we had the right amount of solution in here. So it's important to make sure that you're getting the volume when one drop changes your solution from clear to pink. It will take some practice, but we believe that uh, you've all got the skills uh, to handle that and are capable of doing so. And our challenge to you is when you perform this uh, titration, uh, when you do your uh, calculations of your accuracy and precision, which I'm going to go over in a second, our, uh, how to do in Excel, that your relative standard deviation, your RSD, is 25 or less when you complete the experiment. Uh, which should be very possible given that you have a very accurate and precise instrument to use in the burette. So now that I've performed my titration, I'm ready to do my calculations in Excel. I have here a full Excel sheet set up for the entire experiment. We'll use some other parts of it later on um, as we get to those, but we've actually got a full uh, sheet ready to go before we even do our experiment. If you look close, you'll notice we've already done our other titrations, but we'll get to those in a minute. So for now, I want to focus on this section of my sheet, the standardization of NaOH. You notice I label each of my sections uh, on what I'm going to be doing in that section, and that just helps me better organize myself, and it makes it easy for my TA, uh, if I were to be turning this into a TA, to figure out what everything on the sheet is. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the molarity of our NaOH. 
So, in order to calculate the, vol the molarity of NRH, the first thing we need is the volume of NaOH. Now, this is a pretty straightforward calculation. Like always in Excel, we press equals to start doing a calculation. We're going to highlight the final reading of our burette, and we're going to subtract the initial reading of our burette. So, 15.7 minus 5.21 is 10.66 milliliters, like Colin mentioned earlier, and uh, these volumes are the ones that we just measured in the video a minute ago. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to be able to convert my mass of KHP into a molarity of NaOH using the exact calculation that Colin showed you. If you don't remember exactly how to do that calculation by hand, I recommend you go back in the video and watch Colin go through that again. But for now, I'm going to do it in Excel. So what I need to do is I need to go from grams of KHP to moles of KHP to moles of NaOH, and then I divide my moles of NaOH by liters of NaOH in order to get my molarity. So I start with my grams of KHP. Now I need to divide that by the molar mass of KHP in order to convert it to moles of KHP. The molar mass of KHP is 204.22, so that'll convert to moles of KHP. Once I have moles of KHP, I need to convert to moles of NaOH. To do that, I'm going to use the balanced uh, stoichiometric chemical equation. And my stoichiometric coefficients in this case are 1 and 1. So I could write in here that I multiply by 1 and divide by 1. But that's kind of silly to do in Excel because we're not keeping track of units per se in Excel. So I'm just going to skip that step and we're going to assume I've now converted to moles of NaOH. Well, once I've converted to moles of NaOH, the last thing I need to do is divide by the volume of NaOH that I used in liters. So I'm going to divide, and then I'm going to open a parentheses so that I can convert my milliliters into liters before I perform the division. So to convert from milliliters to liters, I'm going to just divide my milliliters by a thousand and close my parentheses. So now I have grams of KHP converted to moles of KHP divided by, by dividing by the molar mass of KHP, which will give me moles of KHP. I convert to moles of NaOH, which is a one-to-one -one ratio, so we don't have that written in. Then I divide by the volume of NaOH that I used in liters uh, by dividing the volume in milliliters by a thousand. If I press enter, you'll see that my molarity of my NaOH is 0 0.100597836. Now, of course, in the lab, we don't have that many sig figs. Uh, we're not going to be able to use a, uh, you know, nine sig fig number. So we'll want to round to the appropriate number of sig figs, which considering the last calculation we did using this number and this number was multiplication and division, and both of those numbers have four significant figures, we're going to use four significant figures here as well, uh, just for now to give us the idea of what we have. So if I round down, we have uh, 0.1006 molar NaOH. Now, when you do this in lab, I'm not going to now, just for uh, brevity's sake, uh, when you do this in lab, you're going to do this calculation three more or two more times for a total of three trials. For the volume of NaOH calculation, all you need to do is drag it down and it'll calculate it for you because you'll be entering your final and initial readings of your burettes into these cells as you make them. Uh, and then this will automatically subtract them to give you your uh, volume of NaOH. It can work uh, such that if you're not draining any additional NaOH out of your burette in between trials, which there's really no reason to be, your final reading of one titration should just be the initial reading of your next titration. So you can press equals and select it if you want, or just type it in, it's really up to you. For this calculation, everything we have is going to be measured uh, on the same line, so all we need to do to calculate the rest of those values is to divide, uh, drag down as well. Of course, we have a divide by zero error because we don't have any numbers entered here, so the calculation doesn't work. Now, uh, for now, I'm going to delete that so that I can do my next step. So once you've got all three trials and you've calculated your molarity for all three trials, you need to do your statistical analysis. In this case, we uh, can't act calculate an accuracy because there's no accepted literature value for the molarity of NRH, but we can do some uh, other statistical analysis, including the uh, precision uh, of, our of our titrations. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the average. We're going to calculate the average, and then we're going to use the average moving forward in order to do all of our calculations for the molarity of our acetic acid, because we're just going to use our three trials instead of one, because that's just a better scientific practice. So as always, when we want to calculate the average in Excel, we type equals, we type in average, and we highlight the cells we want to take the average of. 
we close our parentheses and we hit enter. In this case, it's going to be the same as my uh, one trial because I've only got the one trial. So we also want to calculate our precision, which is going to be our standard deviation. Uh, and to do that, as always, we equals STDEV, open our parentheses, highlight our data, close our parentheses, and hit enter. Now, of course, we only have one value, so standard deviation isn't going to work correctly um, in Excel. But if we were to perform our other uh, trials, we would get a standard deviation. The last thing we need to do is calculate our relative standard deviation, which is our standard deviation divided by our average times a thousand. We multiply times a thousand, not just typing a thousand. Uh, it's times a thousand because we always report our uh, relative standard deviations in this class to parts per thousand. So we do times a thousand, we hit enter, and again, because we have the standard deviation error, it's not going to work quite right, but that would normally give you your relative standard deviation. I do want to reiterate here that using a burette is a very precise way of determining concentration, so you should be able to get a very small relative standard deviation in class, and I will again challenge you to try to get a relative standard deviation of 25 or lower when you do this in class. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Colin, who's going to go over the uh, next part of the uh, experiment where we're going to find the Ka uh, of concentration by performing a titration of our acetic acid. Previously, we discussed that our ultimate goal here is to find the concentration of the um, acetic acid so that we can determine the Ka of the solution. So the Ka is going to be um, H3O plus CH3COO minus over the concentration of acetic acid. So in order to do that, we needed to know the concentration of NaOH. And Tim just showed you on the video how we're going to use Excel to calculate that concentration. And of course, that also involves the titration. So the next thing we need to do is we need to make our acetic acid solution. And to do that, you're going to take 6.0 molar acetic acid and you are going to um, make 150 milliliters of zero, approximately 0 0.1 molar acetic acid. So you are again, just like you did for the NaOH, going to want to use C1V1 equals C2V2. This time it's 6 molar instead of 5 molar, but essentially um, it's the same calculation. So you're going to want to make 150 milliliters of that solution, just like the NaOH solution, as Tim mentioned. It's the only one in existence at that concentration, so be careful with it. Don't pour it out, so on and so forth. The next thing we want to do is we want to do this titration here. And we want to use the same NaOH that's already in the burette, but this time we want to titrate 10 milliliters of the approximately 0 0.1 molar CH3COOH. We want to titrate exactly 10 milliliters. And in my example, the initial reading of NaOH is 8.76 milliliters. The final burette reading of NaOH is 18.82 milliliters, which means that the volume of NaOH is 10.06 uh, milliliters. So I just took this and subtracted that. So this is the titration data. Now Tim just showed you how to do a titration and how to make sure that you get the endpoint with exactly one drop and how you should have an RSD less than 25. The same thing applies to this titration. You're just going to do three more titrations, but in this time, instead of titrating the KHP, you're going to titrate the acetic acid solution that's made like this. You should do this recipe before you come to class so you know what to do. So now ultimately we want to calculate the molarity or the concentration of acetic acid. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, in order to do that, we're going to go from liters of the NaOH solution to moles of NaOH to moles of acetic acid that I'm going to abbreviate AA. And then finally to, we're going to divide by the liters of the acetic acid and that will give us the molarity of the acetic acid. 
So that is what we're going to do. So in this case, we want to start with the volume of NaOH, which is um, in liters. So we need to take that and divide by 1,000. So 0 0.01006 liters of NaOH. Now we need to use the molarity of NaOH to convert to moles. We want to use the average molarity from the previous three titrations. In our case, we only did one trial, so we're going to use the molarity of the one trial, but in your case, you're going to use the average. So we're going to put one liter of NaOH on the bottom, and our particular NaOH solution had 0 0.1006 moles of NaOH. Here, you're going to use your molarity number of moles because your solution will, will likely be a slightly different concentration than ours. Now, we want to convert from moles of NaOH to moles of acetic acid. Well, we have a balanced chemical equation. It's one to one. So for every one mole of NaOH, it'll take one mole of acetic acid to react with it. Times, we now want to convert this moles to a molarity. We put a unit list one on top, that moves the moles over. Then we divide by the volume of acetic acid we used in liters. In our case, 0 0.01000 liters. In your case, you're also going to use exactly 10.00 milliliters. So this number will not change. And when we do all that math, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat to the end, we find that our acetic acid is 0 0.1012 molar acetic acid. You're going to repeat this for three trials, doing three titrations, and calculate the molarity of the acetic acid over those three trials. You'll then again calculate the average, the standard deviation, and the relative standard deviation. And again, if you work carefully, your relative standard deviation should be less than 25. We can then ultimately use that number to calculate the Ka of the acetic acid by method one. Before we do that, though, I want to uh, turn it over to Tim, who's going to show you how to actually do these same calculations in Excel. So, as Colin said, I'm going to walk you through on how to calculate the molarity of your acetic acid using um, Microsoft Excel. So, our Microsoft Excel, we're going to be doing things uh, similar, similarly to what we did before. The first thing we need to do is we need to calculate our volume of NaOH. You'll see I'm still on my same sheet from before. I still have my numbers entered from what we did before, and I still have uh, areas set up to do the rest of the experiment later. Um, again, it's important that you separate out your experiment so that you know where everything is uh, in case you need it. So, the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate the volume of NaOH we used in order to perform our titration. So again, we do that the same way. We take our final burette reading and we subtract our initial burette reading. So in this case, uh, just like Colin said, it took 10.06 milliliters of NaOH to do the titration. So now we're ready to calculate our molarity. So to calculate our molarity, we need to start with our liters of NaOH. We're going to convert that to moles of NaOH, which we're going to convert to moles of acetic acid, and then divide by our liters of acetic acid in order to get our final uh, concentration. So the first thing we need is liters of NaOH. To, so to calculate liters of NaOH, I'm going to start with some parentheses. I'm going to select my volume in milliliters of NaOH, and I'm going to divide by a thousand because that's how we convert from milliliters to liters. So now that I have my volume in liters, I need to convert that to moles. Well, to convert from liters to moles, you need to multiply by the molarity. So I'm going to multiply by the molarity. Now the molarity is up here. And I'm going to make sure I choose my average molarity so that it takes into account all three trials. So I've selected my average, which in my case is only based on one trial, but in your case it'll be based on all three trials. So now by multiplying my volume in liters times my molarity, I've converted to moles of NaOH. The next thing I need to do is I need to convert from moles of NaOH to moles of acetic acid using the stoichiometric coefficients. Like Colin said before, the stoichiometric coefficients for this uh, reaction are 1 to 1. So just like last time, I'm going to skip typing that in because it's silly to write times 1 divided by 1. So now I've got my number in moles of acetic acid, so I need to divide by my liters of acetic acid in order to calculate my molarity. So to do that, I'm going to divide by my liters, but to divide by liters, I need to convert my milliliters into liters. 
So I'm going to select my volume of acetic acid in milliliters here, and just like I have the other three times I've done this in this uh, video, I'm going to divide by 1,000 in order to convert from milliliters to liters. So now I have my volume of NaOH in liters by dividing by 1,000, converted to moles by multiplying by my molarity, divided by the volume of acetic acid in liters in order to determine the molarity of my acetic acid, which when I hit enter, I get 0 0.1012 with some extra numbers. So again, we're going to use these buttons up here in order to shrink that down to the appropriate four sig figs and find, just like Colin said, we have a molarity of 0 0.1012 uh, for our acetic acid. Now again, we're going to do the same thing that we did before to calculate our average standard deviation and relative standard deviation down here, but I'm not going to go over how to do that again because by now you know how to do it. Um, in this case, however, just make sure you're doing the calculations for your molarity of acetic acid, which will be in these three cells, and not on any of your other values. So, now that we've got our volume of acetic acid calculated, we're just about ready to finish uh, the experiment. But before we uh, show you how to finish it in Excel, I'm going to turn it back to Colin, uh, who's going to start off by talking about what we're going to do next. So now Tim has showed you how to calculate the average concentration of acetic acid, as well as the standard deviation and the relative standard deviation using Excel over your three trials. We now know this value. And you'll, rec you'll remember previously we discussed that Ka is equal to the concentration of the first product, H3O plus, concentration of the second product, CH3COO minus, over the concentration of the acid, CH3COOH. So this is the formula for Ka, and you'll remember we talked about how we don't put water in there because water is a liquid and liquids and solids don't go in the equilibrium expression. So this is the Ka equilibrium expression for this weak acid. Well, this is no longer a variable, so we're good to go. And as Tim will show you in a minute, we're the next thing we want to do is we want to find the pH of the solution. And once we find the pH, which in our case, the pH is going to equal negative, or excuse me, 2.88, not negative 2.88, but 2.88, we're going to then use that to find the concentration of H3O+. Plus. That, combined with the average concentration of um, the acetic acid, will give us the Ka, which can, we can then convert to a pKa. So to use the pH to find the H3O+, plus, we know that concentration of H3O+, plus equals 10 to the negative pH. So the concentration of H3O+, plus in our case, equals 10 to the negative 2.88 and the concentration of H3O plus equals 1.3 times 10 to the minus three molar. So on your calculator, you'd hit the shift log or the inverse of the log, second log, whatever it is on your particular calculator to the negative pH, and you'd find the concentration of H3O plus. But if you notice in the balanced chemical equation for every H3O plus we get, we also get a CH3COO minus. So this also equals the concentration of CH3COO minus. We now know all the variables in order to find Ka. So Ka equals 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3 times 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3, or 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3 squared divided by the average concentration of um, the acetic acid from the titrations. So in our case, we only did one value, but you're going to use your three and average them, but our one value was 0 0.1012. And when you do that math, you find that the Ka equals 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5. We can also find the pKa. The pKa equals the negative log of the Ka. The P of anything in these calculations is the negative log of those. The pH is negative log of H3O+. So in our case, the pKa equals the negative log of the Ka we just found, which is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5. And by method 1, 
we find that the pKa is 4.8. So now we have a um, way to identify the pKa of the acetic acid by using a titration to find the concentration of the acetic acid and using a pH meter to find the concentration of H3O plus and therefore the concentration of acetate minus. Tim will now walk you through how to actually make the pH readings and how to do these calculations in Excel. When we come back, when I come back, we'll talk about um, method two for finding a pKa where we make a buffer solution and find the pKa by another method. So as Colin said, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how to calculate or find rather the pH of your acetic acid solution. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to open up Microlab and we're going to start a Microlab experiment and we're going to hit OK. Once we do that, our uh, familiar screen will show up and we'll need to set it up in order to read uh, pH. So what you'll do is you'll plug your pH probe into the front of your micro lab. There's only one spot it fits, so uh, it's pretty obvious where it goes, but you'll see it in a second anyways. And what we're going to do is we're going to click add sensor. Now we need to choose our sensor and we're going to choose pH slash DO. We only care about the pH part. And then it wants us to click where on the micro lab we plugged it in. Well, like I said, there's only one spot it can go. It's where you've got it plugged in. So we're going to click that and we're going to choose pH because that's what we're trying to measure. Then we just click use factory calibration and our sensor will appear in the corner. So for now, I've got it in some water that I you know, must have gotten a little bit of acid in. So my pH probe is around 4.8. If I pull up my camera here, you can see that that's what I've got. I've got my pH probe in a little bit of water here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it into my acetic acid solution. And I'm going to swirl my pH probe around like this in order to measure my pH. So I'm going to take it out. I'm going to let it drip off. I'm going to put it into my acetic acid and I'm going to swirl it. And I'm going to try to hold it so that you can see. Swirl it around like this. Now you'll see my pH comes down, it fluctuates a little bit, and it stops at 2.884 for my pH. So I have a pH of 2.884. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that out and I'm going to put it back into my uh, water solution and swirl it around so that it's cleaned off. I should also, uh, if I was going to do more measurements, I would use a beaker of water or a squirt bottle to rinse off my pH probe after I take it out of my water and before I put it back into my other solutions. This is just so that we're not contaminating each solution. Like I said, this beaker is only supposed to have water in it, which should have a pH of 7, and it's reading with a pH of 4.64. So clearly I've contaminated this with a little bit of acid. But that's not a big deal because I'm not trying to do multiple measurements. So now we've measured the concentration of our acetic acid in our solution, so we can uh, or rather we've measured the concentration of hydrogen in our uh, acetic acid solution, and we can go ahead and uh, calculate the Ka in Excel. So that's what I'm going to do next. So let's go ahead and calculate our Ka in Excel. Uh, in our Excel sheet that we've had before, there is a spot for pH where I'm going to enter what we measured, 2.88. It was around 2.884, but we're going to round to two decimal points because that's just usually what we do with, um, excuse me, with uh, pHs. So we've got a pH of 2.88. Now, I know I have three spots here for it, but we're just going to use the same pH for all three trials. You don't need to measure it three different times. You can just use the one measurement for all three. And now we're going to calculate the Ka of our acetic acid and the pKa of our acetic acid based on our titration and pH reading. So to do that, we're going to do the math that Colin said before. First, we're going to be needing to multiply the concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of CH3COO minus, which we're going to get from our pH. If you'll remember, pH uh, relates to the concentration of H3O plus by 10 to the negative pH is equal to the concentration of H3O plus. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a parentheses because I like to use parentheses a lot when I'm doing exponents and I'm going to do 10 to the which is uh, done using a caret in Excel and I'm going to do another parentheses because I'm going to need to multiply by negative 1 so negative 1 times our pH so now we have 10 to the negative pH 
So this will give us the concentration of our H3O+. Now we're going to multiply that by the concentration of our CH3COO-, which is the same number, so all we need to do is square it. So now we're going to take our 10 to the negative pH squared, and we need to divide it by the concentration of our acetic acid, which I'm going to put in some extra parentheses just so that I make sure Excel is doing exactly what I want it to. So now I need to divide by the concentration of our acetic acid, which I'm going to get from right here. When you do this, you're going to want to use the average molarity of your acetic acid. In this case, I've only done one trial, so I only have the one value, but you'll have done three trials, so you'll have three values, and you'll be able to use your average. So, I have 10 to the negative pH squared divided by the concentration of my acetic acid. When I hit enter, we'll find that the number, just like Colin said, is 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth. So again, just like we've done before, we're going to shrink down our uh, sig figs a little bit because we clearly don't have 11 significant figures here. So we have our Ka of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5, just like Colin said we would. So now the last thing we need to do is we need to convert from Ka to pKa. So to do that, we do equals, because again we're doing math in uh, Excel, and we do the negative log of Ka. So to do that, we're going to do negative 1, rather negative 1, times the log, which in Excel is done by typing log, open our parentheses, and select our value. So now we have negative 1 times the log of our Ka value, which gives us our pKa, which is 4.8, and in this case uh, Excel has decided to tell us it's times 10 to the 0th power, which is 1, so it's just 4.8. Now, you'll notice I have a spot here for my average, my standard deviation, my relative standard deviation, but if I'm calculating my Ka based on an average here, and I'm using this pH here, then each of my three trials is also going to be based off the same pH and the same average molarity. So there's not really a sense to do this calculation multiple times. So we can just get rid of the rest of this, and we only need to calculate it once. But like I said, we have done our calculation once, and we've calculated our pKa to be 4.8. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Colin, who's going to go through the second way that we can calculate the pKa of a solution by making a buffer. So now we want to talk through the second way that we are going to determine the um, Ka of the um, acetic acid, or the pKa of the acetic acid, and that is by making a buffer solution. So if we look here, we have CH3COOH plus water yields H3O plus plus CH3COO minus. And if this were made into a buffer solution where it contained both the acid and its conjugate base, as we talked about quite some time ago in the video, we could then use the Henderson-Hasselbach in order to find the pKa. And specifically, the Henderson-Hasselbach equation is pH equals pKa plus log of base, in this case CH3, COO minus, over the concentration of the acid, acetic acid, CH3, COOH. So we're going to use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. However, we're going to use it in a very specific way. And the specific way we're going to use it is we're going to make the concentration of CH3COO minus and the concentration of CH3COOH exactly the same. And if we do that, we're going to make them, in this case, the same as the concentration of CH3COOH, which is 0.1012 molar. So then we have pH equals pKa plus log of 0.1012 divided by 0.1012. Well, the log of 0.1012 divided by itself is 1, and the log of 1 is 0. So then pH simply equals pKa. Said another way, that if we make a 0.1012 molar acetate solution, then we mix it with an equal volume of the acetic acid solution, although the concentrations technically won't be this, there'll be half of this, because if we mix 50 and 50, we're going to dilute them by half. That doesn't matter. They'll be the same, 
And therefore, when these two concentrations are the same, the pH equals the pKa. Said another way, we can simply get the pKa by measuring the pH of the solution using the pH meter as Tim just described. So this is basically what we want to do. Well, in order to do this, we need to make the 0 0.10 um, 1, 2 molar NaA solution. And specifically, we're going to use CH3 COO minus Na plus solid. This is going to be our source of acetate, sodium acetate. You can't buy a bottle of acetate. You can't put a bunch of negative ions in a bottle. They're going to repel each other. So you need a counter ion. In this case, we're going to use a counter ion sodium. And in the lab manual, you are asked to make 100 milliliters of this solution. So when you do this, you want to simply start with liters of NaA. So this I'm going to call NaA, sodium acetate. We want to convert that to moles of NaA. And then finally to grams of NaA. So in our case, we want to make 100 milliliters. That's what you want to make. So that is 0 0.1000 liters of NaA. Now we want to convert it to moles using the molarity. Remember, we want it to be 0 0.1012 molar, which means for every one liter of NaA, we're going to have 0 0.1012 moles of NaA times... We now need to convert it to grams using the molar mass and one mole of NaA um, has a molar mass of 82.03 grams of NaA. And when you do all that math, you find 0 0.8301 grams of sodium acetate are required to make this solution. So what we're going to want to do, we're going to want to take um, 0.8301 grams of sodium acetate weighed out on a balance into a teared flask and then we're going to want to put about 100 milliliters of volume in that flask it doesn't need to be perfect it just needs to be in the ballpark then we're going to take 50 milliliters of this solution and mix it with 50 milliliters of the previously prepared acetic acid solution and if you don't have enough, just make sure they're equal volumes. If you use 25 and 25, that will be fine as well. Then swirl the two solutions together and measure the pH. The pH of that resulting solution will be equal to the pKa of acetic acid. And you can then compare that to the pKa of what you got from method one. And make sure that in your conclusion, you comment on how close these two PKIs are together. Now, are they likely to be the exact same number by our method? No, probably not. But should they be close? All right, maybe one is 4.6 and the other one is 4.9 or something like this. It shouldn't be that one is three and the other one is 12. Okay, they should be at least relatively close together. So this will allow you to find another method of finding the pKa. Now, while we have the buffer, we might as well test the buffer. And the last, the very last thing you're going to do is to uh, test the buffer solution. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to record the pH of the buffer. You know, you've already done that. All right. You're then going to want to take the pH of pure water and you're going to want to add a few grains of salt into it because that'll help the uh, pH meter work more ac accurately with a little bit of conductivity. So just the little salt, as little salt as possible as you could put in there as if you were sprinkling, sprinkling salt on a small amount of um, food that you were salting. Okay, just a tiny amount of salt you put in there, swirl it around, measure the pH. Then what we're going to do is we're going to add HCl and NaOH to the buffer. Specifically, we're going to add a few drops of each of these to the buffer solution. And we're also going to add a few drops of um, the HCl and the NaOH to water. So the pH of the buffer should be somewhere around 4.8, if this pKa is to be believed. Because remember, the buffer is going to be equal to the pKa of acetic acid based on the way that we made it. So this will be somewhere around 4.8. This should be somewhere in the ballpark of 7. When we add acid to the buffer, the pH should change very little. So maybe it'll go down from 4.8 to 4.6 or 4.5. When we add base to the buffer, 
it should go up very little. So, for example, if it starts at 4.8, maybe it goes up to 5 or 5.2. How about with water? Just a few drops of HCl in water will change the pH drastically. Maybe it'll start at 7, and maybe it'll go down to, say, 3. And the base will have the opposite effect. Say it starts at 7, maybe it'll go up to 10 or 11. So you'll see a much greater change in pH when you add the HCl and the NaOH to water than you do with the buffer. And here's why. What the buffer contains in it is a mixture of two things. It contains CH3COOH aqueous. And it also contains CH3COO minus aqueous with a spectator ion being Na+. So what happens? If we add a base to this, like say NaOH, this NaOH is going to react with the acetic acid. And what you're going to do is you're going to form more CH3COO minus aqueous, and it'll have an, sorry, it'll have an Na plus with it, okay, aqueous, and H2O liquid. So the way I like to think about this is we've turned a strong base, NaOH, into a weak base, sodium acetate, and therefore the NaOH will have a great drastic change in the pH, maybe three or four pH units when it's in water, and the CH3COO- minus will have a very minor effect in pH. Maybe it'll be 0.3 or 0.5 pH units instead of three or five pH units. What about if we add HCl? Well, if we add HCl aqueous to this, it will react with the CH3COO minus, the sodium acetate that we put in the buffer solution. And we'll make CH3COOH aqueous, and Cl minus here will be the counter ion. So just like we turned the strong base into a weak base, we turn the strong acid into a weak acid. And therefore, you'll have a much less drastic change on the pH. And this is how a buffer works. Since a buffer contains both the weak acid and its conjugate base, it can neutralize both acids and bases added. Now, as you've probably learned in your lecture course, there is a buffering capacity, meaning that if you took six molar HCl and you added 50 milliliters to 50 milliliters of your buffer solution, yeah, in this case, are you really going to not have a pH change? No. You can't um, neutralize an infinite amount of acid with uh, a small quantity of dilute buffer. However, um, in this case, we're only adding a few drops and we're adding 0.1 molar um, HCl and 0.1 molar NaOH. So it's a relatively low concentration just to see the effect. Again, you're going to record the different pHs and compare them to the original pH. What you should find is that the buffer pH changes relatively little and the water pH ch changes far more. So I'd like to thank you for watching the video and I hope you found this helpful um, and it helps you uh, to perform this uh, lab in an um, understandable way.